there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, 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 we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we gather to spend time together in his word, his life-giving word, the breath of life. Hallelujah. His powerful word. Yeah, uh, we're going to be starting something... Uh, and, I want to say something new. It's not new. It's been around for a couple of thousand years. But that's uh, and that's a study of revival and church growth, and it'll primarily come from the uh, book of Nehemiah. Okay, so we're going to do that right after Mark asks for God's blessing to give us understanding of His Word. Yes. Oh Lord, we love Your Word. We love the wisdom and understanding, and and because it's you, we love it even more. But we ask for wisdom and guidance, and for you to just open this up to make your word a living word to us. Amen. 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 Yes, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Yes, Lord. Okay, as I said, it's going to be a study of, of revival. Because I, I think, no, I don't think. I know from many, many, many years of experience that revival is something that I see as very frequently misunderstood by the body of Christ. Right. Um, as I said, we're going to be looking at the letter, the book of Nehemiah, because that is a revival story. Mm -hmm. And by the way, just for your information, originally Nehemiah was part of the book of Ezra. We now have Ezra and Nehemiah, ah. but they were just broken up because of the length of them, all right? So that period is all together and intertwining. I like That's revival. Right. It's a continuation of that. Right. Revive us, O oh Lord. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I like I like revival. We need revival. Yes. But it troubles me to drive around the United States, particularly I think in the spring, when you see signs in front of all these churches: "Revival here, Friday night at seven o'clock." Because I'm not quite sure how you can put God on your schedule. Yes. How you can schedule a revival. How you can schedule a revival. How you can tell the Holy Spirit when to, when to move. But that's that's another story. Not everybody loves revival. Mm. I, I, I imagine that most Christians, Bible-believing Christians, quote-unquote, would say that they love revival. Mm. Years ago, I, it was 1982, as I recall, when Alice and I were traveling around the country and I was ministering in churches around the country. Mm -hmm. And I had been invited to a church in Central Florida. And the pastor asked if I would come and preach revival for a week. Yes, yes. Well, so I said, certainly I will. That's what I do. So I went and for a week I brought sermons about revival, about, about the blessing of having a right relationship with the Lord. The worst thing that could happen, the worst thing that could possibly happen, actually happened. Mm -hmm. Revival broke out. Yes. Because while they invited me to do it, what what they what happened was true revival. Mm -hmm. When people got excited about Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden their relationship with him became real and alive. Kindled uh, the fire yeah. in them. Yeah. And as frequently happens, that will run afoul mm -hmm. of traditions. Yes. That will run afoul of being comfortable where you are. Mm -hmm. Because revival will take you places that you've never been before. It will take you to the heights of the glory of God. Right? It will bring change. It will bring change. And challenge. Well, that's what you're praying for. You're praying for change. Mm -hmm. But the simple fact of the matter is all too many Christians don't really want change no. because they're comfortable exactly where they are. That was quite an experience. Yes, it was. So revival, revival is to return to life, okay? To return to consciousness, vigor, strength, or a flourishing condition. That's from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. To be quickened, restored, or renewed as hope, confidence, suspicions, suspicions and, or memories. These things are quickened, right? Mm -hmm. To become operative or valid again. That's from the Random House Dictionary, okay? Want to know an example of that? Okay. In the parable, the well-known parable of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. when the father said, 
for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Luke 15, 24. I'm going to tell you, true revival will always bring celebration. Yes. Starting with the Father. Okay? Amen. Yeah. So revival is not about the unsaved. Okay? Now, that's a really, really important point. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Revival, it's about those, it's about the uncommitted. <laughs> It's about the quote-unquote saved who are uncommitted. It's about restoring them, okay, to a, to a fiery relationship with the Lord. It's to those who have left their first love. To those who have left their first love. And Alice is referring to, to, to well, in the first letter that the Lord speaks to the church at Ephesus in Revelation. Right. He said, he's saying, talking about the things they have and he's, he's pleased with. But then he says, but this I have against you, you've left your first love, mm -hmm. Okay. It's about, revival is also about renewal. It says in Romans 12, 12 to, right? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It's about reformation, okay? Reform. We don't hear a lot of that. I mean, you talk about the Protestant Reformation that happened in the time of Martin Luther, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago. But I think we need reformation. That's something we need to see in the church today is reformation. Mm -hmm. Because reformation is the improvement or amendment of what's wrong, corrupt, unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The amendment of conduct, belief, or such things. To cause a person to abandon wrong or evil ways of life or conduct. Mm -hmm. Again, from the Random House Dictionary. That's what reform is about. So these things are, go hand in glove, as the saying goes. You know, that revival, reformation, restoration, all these things go together, right? The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, this is from Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. He reformed it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. When it wasn't the way it was supposed to be, he reformed it, okay? So to this purpose, uh, there's a purpose to all of this, mm -hmm. it's restoration, okay? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. God has a purpose in all of this, in revival, reformation, renewal, renewal and okay. that's to bring us back more and Stars. more to look like his son, Christ Jesus. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, Genesis 1, this is where it begins. And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. That's what God is doing in our lives individually mm -hmm. and in the church corporately. All right. Revival, there's a, a man that I've been so blessed by over the years. His name is Leonard Ravenhill. He was from Leeds, England. Where we have dear friends and have spent time. But he wound up coming to the United States of America, being involved in ministry here. And his heart was for revival. He wrote many tracts, books, pamphlets, and everything on revival. One of, one of the ones I would always recommend for people to find and read is Why Revival Tarries. Okay, but in that book he, or pamphlet, booklet, whatever it was, he said, what God wants is not to fill empty pews. He is not concerned about filling empty churches. He is concerned about filling empty hearts and empty lives and empty eyes that have no vision, empty hearts that have no passion and empty wills that have no purpose. That's a brilliant, brilliant statement. Mm. And, and please think about it, okay? Think about that. 
That's what revival is, and that's what God's purpose is in revival. It's not about church growth. No. At least it's not supposed to be. The only thing is, that seems to be what most people consider it and what the church is turning it into, okay? It's a numbers game. Yes, and I, I do want to talk about church growth for a minute, right? I want to talk about church growth. Where's the music? <laughs> the good, the bad, and the yeah. ugly, okay? <laughs> There are three reasons that churches grow. Yes. The first is because Christ is lifted up and exalted and men are drawn to him. The second is because they are drawn by something in the natural that is attractive to the natural man. Mm -hmm. And because they are there to bring destruction. The church world today, particularly in the West, is filled with church growth seminars. Okay. Mm -hmm. With congregational leaders paying great fees to go and attend these things, from the ties, of course, to, to, to find out how to make more people, in, bring more people into the church, right. fill the seats. Because all too often it's about. Uh, Bucks and butts. And buildings. And buildings. Yeah. Right, which you need the money for. The answer is always she, she, yeah, she said that, remember. If you want to, you can write to Alice. That's okay. Butts, bucks, and buildings. That's, that's too. That's, well, that's too often the focus of, quote, church, all right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're teaching people how to build their, their churches, their congregations, into ever larger organizations. And that's it, perhaps with a more attractive, larger building, mm -hmm. uh, with a more modern logo. Or hiring a better band to play worship, mm. or getting more relevant for young people, and all too often, what that means is being more and more like the world. Exactly. Okay? Yes, imitating the world. Yeah. Yeah. Think about these things, please. The first cause I said is the good, right? Mm -hmm. Because Christ is exalted, the Spirit of life. From the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit filled those gathered with His power, the church proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Yes. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls, it says in Acts 2, 4, right? Mm -hmm. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, certainly, Jesus said that. I mean, this is clear what Jesus said. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto yes. to myself. Mm -hmm. John 12, 12, 32. The word of the cross is boldly proclaimed. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.18. You know, we, have a, we had a dear brother who was a pastor of a church here in Central Florida. And he's now gone to his reward, praise God. But he's, he was part of a denomination, or the church that he pastored was part of a denomination that is not known for uh, its thriving vibrancy. Yeah. A denomination, right? Mm -hmm. And yet his church, very much unlike what was going on throughout the denomination, particularly in the southeast, mm -hmm. was growing and was vibrant. So the 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 leader, I don't know, uh, leadership of the leadership of that branch or that denomination kept asking him, "What kind, what program are you running? What's what? How are you doing this? What's the program you're running?" He said, "I'm not running a program." He said, I'm telling them about a person, Jesus Christ. And they would ask him again, well, yeah, I know, that's, that's good, but what program are you running? He was holding Bible studies. To Constantly. All, you know, all throughout. And he was yeah. proclaiming Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. They didn't seem to get that. And I, he's, he's, as I say, he's going to be with the Lord. And I don't know that they've ever still gotten that. That, de that denomination is concerned about their increasingly empty buildings, right. okay? Yes. If you allow it to become about programs, about the size of your congregation, rather than about the kingdom of God, then you enter into the realm of the second reason, the bad, right? Mm. Because the flesh is filled, the spirit of death. The first one was the spirit of life. Yes. This is the spirit of death. You know, in, in, the, in the days of the early church, it was obvious that many people were in need, as today, right? Mm -hmm. Yet there was one group, highly visible because of their spiritual boldness, in which there was no need. See Acts 2, 44 to 46, 
in Acts 4, 32 to 35. God was blessing the church, the body of Christ. He was blessing his people. There wasn't any need there. No need among them. Okay. So in a world, in a time when there was a lot of need, and people saw this group with no need, don't you think that they were drawn there? Yes. To meet their needs rather than to meet their Lord. Right. That's a danger, okay? Yes. yes. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Mm -hmm. John 6, 26. He said that about a, a lot of the people who are filling him. Mm -hmm. Today, people are hungry. They're hungry for, not just for food. They're hungry for more self-esteem, yes. for a healthier, wealthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Hungry for the accoutrements of success as defined by the world. Mm -hmm. They're hungry for acceptance and approval in an ever more self-centered world. As foretold in his, Paul's letter to Timothy, he said, but realize this. That in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of self and lovers of money. Second Timothy 3, 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Mega churches today are all too often filled with the many that Jesus spoke of. Those that choose the wide gate and the easy way that unfortunately leads to destruction. Okay? That fills up a lot of churches. And then, as I said, there's a third way. And this indeed is... The ugly. Churches will grow because the enemy plants tares yes. mm. in the fields of wheat, right? right? The spirit of destruction. So I've talked about the spirit of life, the spirit of death, and now the spirit of destruction. See, before this problem arose in Jerusalem, Jesus told the parable of the tares and the wheat, showing a tactic of the our enemy, the devil, to place imitators among the true believers. And his purpose is constant, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why it says in 2 Peter 2, 1, Peter wrote and said, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them and bring swift destruction upon themselves. We are well warned about this, all right? Yes. This oh, is not many times. Please, yes. yeah. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus said that in Matthew seven fifteen. Mm -hmm. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Galatians two four. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, 28, and 29, right? Satan, who comes disguised as an angel of light, yes. wants to fill the pews. And believe me, that's not revival. Not at all. Not at all. Mm -mm. So when you talk about revival, be conscious of this, be aware of this. You know, love rejoices in the truth. We have to be on guard. Mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul is a... I think, I, I think he's going to be with Lord now. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. positive about that, but I think, think so. Who has been a, a really great teacher, all right? And he did a study in 2010 about the spirit of revival. And he looked at the ministry of Jonathan Edwards. Mm -hmm. Now, Jonathan Edwards preached that amazing sermon, powerful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God in 1748, here in the U.S., that, that continued and made revival break out mm -hmm. before the rebellion, all right? You may call it a revolution. Mm -hmm. So Edwards dealt with the issue of signs that give evidence of the work of God in revival. You know, when I hear... People tell me, oh, there's a revival taking place here. And, yes. and they talk about the signs, all right? The things that they see that tell them that revival is breaking mm -hmm. out. Well, here, I want to I want to read to you from what Sproul wrote and talking about quoting Jonathan Edwards. Okay. The Bible does not provide a uniform formula for the proper physical or emotional reactions to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay? The presence of tears convulsions, jerking, laughter, those kind of things, 
are no measure of the Spirit's presence. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not that from the Spirit, but yeah. it doesn't mean that it is. Right. When we canvass the Scripture to see how the saints relate, reacted to the outpouring of the Spirit, we see no prescribed form of bodily behavior. Yeah. Habakkuk mm -hmm. had a quivering lip and a trembling belly. Others fell to the ground as though dead. Some wept, some sang, some were reduced to stunned silence. Mm -hmm. In the light of the diversity of human personalities and indeed the very nature of man, the presence or ab absence of response, these responses is no true test of the authenticity of the Spirit's work. He goes on to say, however, I hasten to add that though a wide variety of emotional responses may be detected in Scripture by those who encounter the living God, there is at least one emotion that may be safely excluded from the list, mm -hmm. namely boredom. <laughs> I guarantee you when revival falls, nobody's going to be bored. That's for sure. <laughs> Is not the true evidence of a changed, a revived person, a changed heart that shows forth the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need is the fruit of the, to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit coming evidence. and it being evidenced in people's lives. Right. Right. That's the true evidence. And that's of it. the test. Now, like I'm saying, the other things may happen and they may be the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But I promise you, that's momentary. He said, you will know them by their fruits. I mean, I, I have been driven to shouts of joy, to tears, and other things because of the whole work of the Holy Spirit come upon me. But that's for a moment. The thing that's lasting is a deeper relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So as a, when you're talking about revival, there has to be, God is a God of good order, right? So there's a good order to this. Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to recognize that the revival is needed. Right. And the way you recognize that is because there's something wrong with what's there, right? Mm -hmm. And that said, the next thing has to be remorse. There has to be remorse. When you see the problem, when you see things wrong in the body of Christ, we should feel remorse. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that should lead to repentance. Yes. yes. And repentance will lead to restoration. So the first thing is to to recognize the problem. So let me read now from the book of Nehemiah, the first chapter, the first verse. These are the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital. That's the capital of the Persian, uh, Persian yeah, right? That Hanai, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity. And about Jerusalem. See, Nehemiah had a concern for the state of the, let me call it the church, for the people of God, for the family of God, not just for his own situation. That's one of the things that is necessary for revival. It's, it's not all about you. Okay? You have to have that heart. Is our prayer life about ourselves? Or is it about the state of the church? So it goes on in the third verse, and he's, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress, distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. The people of God were in disarray and disrepair. They and the city of God were in need of restoration, revival, or reformation. So in verse 4, and this is, this is key to revival. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. Outside a building, not with well-planned programs and not with advertising campaigns, true revival starts this way. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He was brokenhearted. He was brokenhearted, which brings me to... The prayer of David, a man after God's own heart. You want to know what starts revival? He wrote in Psalm, or it's in Psalm 51, verses 9 to 17. David said, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. 
restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Mm. For Listen now. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Psalm 51, right? Mm. 9 through 17. That's where, Jer- that's where Nehemiah was. He was broken hearted over the state of the people of God and the city of God. Mm. If you want to see revival happen, it's not going. It's not going to happen because we got better band music. It's not going to happen because it's not going to be. It's going to happen because we're broken hearted over our not right relationship with God. So, in verse five. I'm going to read verses five through seven. It says, "Nehemiah, I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God." who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, night, day and night. On behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah said, I am praying before you now. And Ezra at the same time, in Ezra 8, I'm reading 21 and 22, he said, Then I proclaimed a fast here at the river river of Ava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king, troops, and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way. Because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. He did not seek the help of the world. He he had told the king about the glory and the power of God. And then, is he going to go out and then turn to the world for an answer? No. So I have a note in that in Ezra, and it says, uh, not looking to the government for help. Amen. The church doesn't have a testimony as long as they trust in the government. Well, Nehemiah nor Ezra, they didn't seek the help of the world. Again, in the Psalm, Psalm 121, he wrote, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains, from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Right? Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. Don't destroy your testimony. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Seek the Lord for revival, for renewal, for all of the things that we need, for new and invigorated life. Well, we can get as far as I had hoped to, but we'll be back and we'll do, we're going to continue on this. Because this is indeed an important subject. We need revival in the church. We need reformation in the church. We need restoration in the church. Real. Not not the plan of man, but the plan of God. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you and praise you, Lord God, that you have revealed your plan to us. Help us to be faithful to follow that, Lord God. Not our way, but your way. Seeking you and your glory. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and goodbye till next time. Thank you.